Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of the 1970 TR6 in the Rusty Beauty Garage. We continue assembling this car after almost a decade of restoration. <laughs> you probably know the story. The restoration started in one shop where I used to be an employee, then it stalled for a few years. It sat in John's garage for a few years and then he brought it to me in my own shop now so I can finish what I started as an employee in the other shop. Anyway, in the previous episode we dealt with some issues that we found out during the first startup after so many years. One carburetor was not working at all, we had to change the radiator because one big portion of it was totally blocked and wasn't working. We changed the oil pump because the oil pressure was low and we changed also the water pump because it was making some noises. There's one more issue that we want to fix and that's the starter motor. So we tried with two different starter motors in the beginning and they were like just not working properly. Then we found a rebuilt one that we installed and that kind of works but it still has hard time cranking the engine. It stops at every firing stroke on every cylinder. It goes <laughs> So that makes me think that we have a pretty high compression on this engine so we should measure it because when I rebuilt the engine a long time ago, I never paid attention to the height of the head. So I don't know, maybe during a previous rebuild it was shaved, maybe it is a uh, high compression ratio right now, so I don't know. So um, we, we're just gonna measure the compression to see what the compression looks like. And uh, we're probably gonna buy a high torque starter just so we can facilitate the cranking process. So we're quickly gonna check the compression and then we're gonna start dealing with things that are preventing the car from driving right now. We have a running engine, we have transmission that has been rebuilt somewhere else, reputable shop, so it should be good. We don't have brakes, we don't have clutch, so we have to deal with all these things because we want to take the car on the road and start test driving so we can deal with issues one by one. Anyway, I'm talking too much, let's get crack up. Okay, the spark plugs are out, and look at that. If you remember the last time, after the first run of the car, when we were running only on one carburetor, this one was totally stuck, there was no fuel coming to the float bowl. So basically, all the cylinders run, but the spark plugs look like brand new. Look at this now. She ran yesterday for about 45 minutes, and all the spark plugs are now super fouled, so she runs rich, I guess. But again, it was idling only, so I'm not gonna do anything about adjustments right now. I wanna adjust the carburetors when we have the opportunity to drive the car around. So for now, we're just gonna leave them like that. All right, so let's do the compression test. Okay, so we have the gauge on the first cylinder. I unplug the ignition coil. So, throttle fully open and let's crank it. Yeah, this is 165. That's pretty high compression. <laughs> so that's why our starter is having a hard time. Actually, I'm gonna put a charger on the battery. And let's try that again. So, 170 even. That's a pretty high compression. So, that explains many things. Okay, let's see the other ones. So, that's number two. Same thing, even 172. Wow. Probably the head has been shaved. 
previously. Had I known that, I was gonna measure the combustion chamber volume at that time, but I probably didn't know what compression ratio was. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. One eighty. Oh my God, that's a pretty high compression. I mean, you guys in the UK probably are not surprised, but for us here, this is a very high compression. We are here like between hundred and forty, hundred and fifty is okay. <laughs> Hundred and seventy. Okay, number five. One seventy two. And one seventy two. Perfect, so they're all between 170 and 180, which is, what, less than 5% or a little bit over 5%. So that explains why we can't crank it when we have the spark plugs on. <laughs> all right, so this is what the compression looks like and that explains why the starter motor can't turn the engine. So I just spoke to John and we are on the same page. We're gonna buy a high torque starter to replace. So we're gonna leave the engine alone for now. And I think uh, the next project should be the slave cylinder. I'm looking for it, I can't find it now. Here it is. And we're gonna mount it. We have also this line here that uh, we run. We bought this braided line so that's what we're gonna hook up to the slave cylinder we have this huge fitting here that came with the line it's already installed installed on the slave cylinder so i'm gonna mount it and we're gonna go from there all right so i installed the slave cylinder we have to take care of these lines as well so this is a brake line this is a fuel line i don't know about the brake line Anyway, okay, so we installed the slave cylinder and uh, I had to extend a push rod that I had from a Sclutch Master cylinder. I know that the original push rod is exactly six inches long from this end to where it touches the piston. So I extended this one, but I don't know. It doesn't seem to be, well, actually, this is where it touches the piston. So it has a lot of play, but I checked on a PR250 that I have here, it is the same. It has this much of a play too, so I don't know, we will see. I was thinking maybe I should make it adjustable since I was making it, but uh, I don't know. We're gonna try it like that, and if it needs to be extended more, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut it off here, and I'm gonna weld a coupling nut, like a longer nut and we're gonna make threads on this so we can adjust the length that's what we're gonna do but uh, we're gonna try it like that so we have here a silicone brake fluid dot five that's what we're gonna use for the brakes and the clutch so i'm gonna pour some and then i'm gonna try to bleed it myself with my vacuum pump we will see if it is going to work. If not, I'm going to wait for someone to come home later tonight to help me bleed it. I'm pressing the pedal and the uh, level goes down a little, pushing some of the air out, which is good. Well, I tried a little bit with uh, just gravity feed and now we actually have some pedal. Yeah, that's no good. 
here is where it starts to engage which is pretty low or disengage the clutch i mean you see i have a little bit of movement here you know what this is where i'm gonna leave it and i'm gonna wait for a helper later tonight to help me bleed it properly with the pump i'm just gonna pull out all the fluid out but i'm not gonna be able to pull out the air i'm pretty sure so anyways i'm gonna leave it here for now and we're gonna continue with something else okay since the front wheels are in the air let's see what's going on here uh, we have multiple things to check on the suspension one of them is the brakes of course but also i want to take a look at the suspension how i assembled it because i watched my video when i was assembling this car and everything seems to be okay but for some reason the stance of the car front and back is super high it's not the same way as when it came well, as when the car came because um, i have pictures from that time and john has pictures and the car was much lower after we rebuilt the suspension without changing the springs the car sits much higher so i want to make sure that everything is assembled right and the third thing here is this the whole hub it has a lot of play and i don't know why that is because when i'm watching my video i tighten these nuts so i don't know why they're loose now and this is like a lot of play a lot so it plays from the hub so anyways let's take it apart and see what's going on there the whole hub uh, okay looks like we have new brakes the calipers i remember john painted them himself and everything is connected here the caliper and all that i just want to make sure maybe i'm gonna take it out and i want to make sure that it doesn't have any brake fluid in it because if there is it's gonna be dot three and we're installing dot five and we're gonna flip the caliper upside down to make sure that there's nothing in it and maybe we can even kind of rinse it we can put some dot five brake fluid in it like very little and just kind of rinse it we're hoping that the calipers are in a good shape i mean they were working i drove the car it had brakes so yeah let me take it out okay so the caliper is out and like i said we're gonna flush it not gonna go further than that but now when i'm looking at the brake lines i remember that we had a conversation with john because these are the original brake lines on the car from a long time ago and we don't know the condition of them so remember that maybe two months ago i had a conversation with john and we decided that we're gonna change all the brake lines with uh, copper nickel one so we have fresh brake lines on the car we want it to be safe on the road right unfortunately i don't know what to do with the height because i was thinking maybe i installed uh, the rear springs in the front but that's not the case because these are definitely front springs they have less coils than the rear ones the rear ones have uh, more coils i think here we have six or seven what do we have one two three four five six and probably seven there the rear ones have nine or ten something like that so you can see they are much more dense even on this car here let me show you that's what we have like one two three four five six six or seven depends what side do you count you know uh and the rear ones are much more dense i don't know if we can see the rear ones here here you see how much more dense the rear ones are and let's check the rear ones in this car see so we didn't install the front springs in the back and the back in the front so i don't know why this car is sitting so high the other thing that i thought initially when i looked at the suspension here with john actually the other day uh, and i looked at these and i said oh my god these are upside down 
the mounting brackets here for the for the control arms but no that's how they are they're not upside down you can't put them the other way around that's how they go plus if we put them the other way around they're gonna go even higher that they're gonna bring the car even higher plus even if we could put them the other way around if we could flip these they're gonna make the frame they're gonna lift the frame even more compared to the control arms so no they are not backwards so that's not the issue so the only issue that i can think of is are these the wrong shocks i don't remember if these are the shocks that the car came with or we bought new ones i have no idea but if they are the wrong shocks imagine if they are too long maybe they're bottoming up when the car is still too high i don't know so you know what we're gonna check that and we're gonna take out the shocks and we're gonna put the car on the ground without the shocks and we're gonna see so we have lots of work ahead of us so let's get crack locking okay let's start with the brake lines and i took out the first one and yeah, they are the old steel brake lines. They are all prone to rust, close to the fittings, usually. And this one is actually good. Or close to clips, like this one. So you see right here, there's lots of pitting on this side. You know what, I'm gonna go clean it on the wire wheel, just so we can see. It actually doesn't look way too bad. I mean... But uh, if we were doing this today, I wouldn't, I would have never put these lines back. The thing is, I'll tell you a secret, at that time my boss didn't want me to work on this car. He was always pushing me to other projects. He was always like, no, oh, leave this car alone. He was always rushing me, just do it quickly. And when I tell him, well, we need to do something else here, he was like, no, 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 it doesn't need it. Believe me, it's okay. And yes, John knows about that. It's not a secret. <laughs> Anyways we're gonna change all the lines we're gonna reuse the fittings wherever we can because they're not in a bad shape but we're gonna change the lines actually on my website rustbeauties.com i have here come on, in the download section i have brake lines this sheet shows you the length and the type of fittings that you need to use and the type of flaring for each and every line for TR6. However, I think there is one mistake on it. I don't remember, so now it's a good chance to double check it. So here it tells you the length and the fittings and you see the fittings. So all the fittings are 316 for 316 cube. However, we have three fittings that are with threads that are 7 16 by 20 outside so all the rest 12 fittings are 3 8 by 24 threads again the whole inside is for 3 16 brake line and we have two types of flare here bubble flare which looks like this and double flare which looks like this normally this is where i have a mistake i think normally where we have a female fitting like this which is again 3 8 24 that's where we have double flare and on these fittings we have a bubble flare however i think there is somewhere where we have a female fitting with a bubble flare so that's why i'm gonna do a sanity check now on my sheet because i think i made a mistake somewhere anyway so this line that i just took off is front left flex holes to front three-way connector that's the one so that's 25 inches let's cut a 25 inches piece prepare the fittings and we will see if it is bubble and double on each side so yes on this side we have a double flare and on this side we have a bubble flare so this one is correct So we cut 25 inches and we deburred it 
Now, before we forget, let's cut off these fittings, clean them up and put them on the line before we flare the line be without them. Not gonna be able to cut this one like that. I don't wanna straighten it because I wanna use it as a pattern later for the bends. Okay, I also took out the three-way splitter from the frame and I'll show you after that how it goes. The fittings are clean now, brand new. So if they are rounded here, it's not worth installing them again, but they're perfectly good. There's nothing wrong with them. So we're gonna use our flaring tool, which, which I bought a few years ago from Amazon. Now, if you go to Eastwood, you're gonna find the exact same tool at a ridiculous price. So I don't think you need to do that because this is the exact same tool. You can buy it now even from Viver or from all kinds of places. You can buy this tool at very different prices. Buy the cheapest one. I'm telling you, it is the exact same tool, just branded differently. I bought this one for real cheap at that time and now they are even cheaper. I don't know how much they are, but they're very, very cheap. But if you, if you need to do brake lines, this is the best. So I'll show you now how it works. Probably most of you know already. I've shown it in my videos before, but I'll show you again now for those of you who never used it. So I showed you already what a bubble flare and what double flare looks like, right? So here inside we have these dice that are uh, specific for size. Let's see what we have here. And they have two sides, each of them, eight millimeters or five sixteenths. Uh, quarter inch, three eighths, and three sixteenths. So that's the one that we need, and we need this side which has the tapered part because here on this side it's flat. This is for different type of flaring, so we have to be careful not to mix them up. We always use this side, and also it has these uh, nipples here and holes that fit within each other and allow you to close it. So if you flip, flip it around, it's not gonna close properly. So always you have to make sure that you're putting them together the proper way. They go like this. Here. And here we have different heads. So for bubble flare, we have one operation. For double flare, we have two operations. And the first step for both of them is the same. Make a bubble flare. And then the second step turns the bubble flare into a double flare. And for all sizes and all operations, we also have this flat die, which is our operation zero, which is to align our fitting in place. We're going to put this before we forget them, even though we still have the one side is not going to be flared, so we can put them later, but it's a good practice to have them in place in the right orientation because it happened to me to put this fitting this way, wrong way, right? <laughs> so, okay, so this is where we're going to need a bubble flare. So let's make a bubble flare. So we put the line inside, we put the other block on top, we make sure that the two dots line up now they don't now the line is not perfectly straight so that's fine then we clamp it it's a little bit too tight we clamp it and we just finger tie it like very very gently then we turn our operation zero the flat die this way and we push. Now you're in my way, sorry. I have to move you a little bit. So I leave it out a little bit, just a little bit, so I know that it is out. And then I push everything, not too hard, but firm, to make sure that the blocks are bottomed out that way and the line is perfectly flat with them. 
So now we can finish this, tightening this. Again, doesn't need to be crazy. For steel lines and for stainless steel lines, you need to tighten more. For these ones, it is so easy, it's crazy. So here we have 3 16 operation one, and here is 3 16 operation two. So one die works for different things. That's also for quarter inch here, whatever, but for not for us, we know this is our operation one that creates bubble flare, and this is our operation two, which turns a bubble into a double flare. So after we use operation zero, that's a mandatory thing for all flares and sizes. Then we go to our 3 16 operation one, and we go literally, now my table is gonna move, but... Okay, it doesn't need much. I mean, it is soft. This line is pretty soft. And then, that's it. For bubble flare, we are done. We can take it out. We have a nice bubble. So the fitting goes like this and compresses it against whatever the other side is. So now let's make a double flare. To make a double flare, like I said, we start the same way. We make a bubble and then with the operation two, we turn it into a double. So again, operation zero is where we start. Just little tension. Operation zero. Tighten it up. Operation one to make a bubble. Sorry. Okay. So now we have a bubble inside, right? I don't want to take it out to show you because we over, we've already seen it. Now we turn operation two in this way and we go and we turn the bubble into a double. Okay. And that's it. Let's see what we've done. There you go. Our bubble turned into a double. You see how fast it is? With this tool, it is totally worth the money, I'm telling you. Even if you're doing one car, it's worth buying the tool. So now we're gonna take this line and we're gonna start bending it. And I figured that for uh, copper nickel lines, I don't even need any special tools. I can basically do it with my fingers. It is so nice and easy to work with. So, this is this side. I remember that this is where the female fitting was. Now, for the longer brake lines, I'm going to show you a trick. I basically take a masking tape and I tape them together. And then I continue with the rest. But for the short ones, I think it is pretty good. See now, this one turns out, it's way too long. Why? So that the chart that I have with the lengths wasn't from original lines. It was from a kit that I bought for a certain car. I think the 74 TR6 at work. So that's where I have the lengths from. But here, obviously, it doesn't need to be that long. So you know what? I'm going to shorten this by two inches and I'm going to correct the chart. I mean, I've done it with the length on the chart and it works, but you know, why don't we make it properly? So that's two inches shorter or inch and a half. That's actually about an inch and a half. Okay, I'll print out the chart and I'm going to mark it.
something like this. I'm gonna go put this on the car and then I'll show you how the line goes on the car. All right, so this is where the three-way splitter is. That's the brake line for the right wheel. This is where the brake line for the left wheel comes. And this is where the one from the PDWA needs to plug in. So this is where our male fitting goes with the bubble flare. This goes behind somehow. I'll figure it out. And on the other side, the double flare bolts into this end of the line. So I'm going to do that on my own because it's tight here and I'll show you. Okay. Perfect. This fits well here. This fits well here. And, and this is where this little clip comes and holds it to the frame and it travels really nice here absolutely no problem so i'm gonna update the chart because it doesn't need to be 25 it can be 23 and a half inches on to the next one i'm gonna make this one next it's a very long one <laughs> all right this mini line is out so that's between the flex line and the caliper so there's a very important point here I explain here in my PDF paper, which I printed, so I can make the corrections. Uh, so from 68 to 72, TR6 should be with calipers that say P and PB, up to this commission number. So these calipers take 3 8 by 24 fitting. For later cars, they switch to calipers, so after 72 to 76, TR6, they switch to calipers that say PB. So these were P and PB. The late PB calipers after CC81079 commission number, they take a metric fitting. So let's see what these calipers say. They should be early here. I believe this is where it says type 16P. So we should be fine sometimes you can't trust the year of the car because somebody might have changed the calipers so we should be good with the 3 8 fittings so here the second page of the pdf file is exactly the same except it adds one more fitting here i said that you need 12 of these 3 8 for the late ones you need only 10 and the other two are the metric ones that go on this short line to fit into the caliper right here. So we're good with the 3 8 here now. So that's something important to know. So I'm going to cut this one. It should be four and a half inches from the front flex hose to the caliper. And as normal, the male fitting has a bubble flare and the female fitting has a double flare. So I'm going to update this PDF file with the corrections that we figured out here during this video. There's a little bit more you're going to see later. And if you need it, you can download it for absolutely free from my website www.restibuties.com. But if you feel like making a donation, there's links in the description of this video showing you how to do that. All right, so I took out the line from between the three-way connector just behind the front left wheel and this is the one going across under the oil sump and to the other wheel on the other side, on the right side, to the flex line. And I already put the fittings on and I started bending it but it is a little bit tricky because now it's longer line so I just wanted to show you my trick with the masking tape. Once you start bending it, like this, how does this go? Am I stupid or what? Yeah, this way. Okay. So that's how far I went and realized that I need to do something like this. Now we can continue. 
and every once in a while we can tape them together again. Of course it's not going to be perfect, but And turns out this one is longer as well. So I would trust the, this line, the steel line, because it looks like these are the original car, the original lines of the car, and it was following the frame pretty well. So I'm gonna shorten this one as well, and I'm gonna update my chart. That's three inches shorter. Okay, and this is how this line is routed from so the left wheel behind the left wheel is the three-way splitter the one that goes to the right wheel is the one in front this is the one that goes to the left wheel as we said and this is the side that feeds them from the splitter it goes around over this cross member like I've seen it here on this side before so now I'm starting to think that this is not uh, original I don't know like I've seen it coming down here maybe on the early cars it was like that I have no idea from, but from here you see it goes up and comes up here and screws to the flex line and then the other side of the flex line is here on this short piece of metal short bracket that goes together with the bolt on the caliper and here we have this uh, short line again that is on the caliper so we're gonna remake this one too and we're gonna move to the next line okay so that's bolted here we have the little line here and now let's remake these two lines so like i said here we have special fittings for the front section of the master cylinder counterintuitively here the rear part of the master cylinder is responsible for the front brakes and the front part of the master cylinder is responsible for the rear brakes so that's why these two lines cross from the rear brakes on the front of the master cylinder it goes to the back of the pdwa so you see the lines cross here and here we have the bigger fitting the 5 16 and here on the front brakes we have the other bigger fitting the 5 16 so i'll take this line out and i'm gonna remake it and i'll show you the difference of the fittings okay i took the two lines out and you can see the difference here in the fittings and same here 5 16 3 8 the hole is the same takes the same line but the threads outside are different okay so we, we replace these two lines now and they are installed okay so this is actually the one that i need now from the pdwa from the front port which is 7 16 to the three-way connector down there to the back which is 3 8 so unfortunately we don't have this line and now i'm gonna have to find fittings i know that i have this one for sure 3 8 i don't have a 7 16 i mean i don't know if i have one so i'm gonna have to go around and look well we have actually that's in john's parts there was this old crappy pdwa which also has another port here and i'm pretty sure that this is also for the front brakes these probably are both 7 16 and this is a 3 8 so let's take them out i know they look crappy believe me they're gonna clean up like brand new
Yeah, you see? And you told they were too crappy to be reused. They are perfect. So now we're gonna use this line because we cut it at 14 inches, but I bent it in the wrong way. So let's see if this two that I invested in is gonna work. I think it's a bad investment, but maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, I think it is bad investment. <laughs> oh my god, and this is copper nickel line that soft. Nothing. <laughs> you know what? This is the worst investment I've ever made. I paid $140, I think, for that. Crap. Well, I shouldn't say that because it's going for sale now. Anybody needs it? Brand new, barely used. All right, so this one is made and installed as well. I don't know how to show it to you, but from the three-way splitter down there, comes this way up go to the front part of the PDWA with the big fitting and the small one there. So one last time, the three bigger fittings are this one, this one, and this one here. Everything else should be the same for early cars. For later cars, the two fittings on the calipers, these ones here are metric. Okay, I'm not gonna say it anymore. <laughs> All right, so this completes the front brakes. Now let's deal with the rear brakes. I already removed the line that is from here to the center of the frame under the car. I'll probe underneath now and I'll show you. And I already made the new one. So for this one, I couldn't keep the shape because it kind of needs to be bent under the car. You can't really take it out without bending it. So I had to bend it to take it out. And we're gonna bend this one when we put it underneath. So this is 33 inches and it has male on this side with a bubble and female with a flare. So the male goes here to the PDWA and the female, this is where it comes down from the PDWA, makes a turn goes through this hole here on the frame which we have too many lines here we're gonna deal with them too and makes a turn here follows the frame and hooks up to this union here in the middle of the frame without this union you can't fit a whole entire length of line here so it comes in two pieces and they join here with this union so I'm not gonna put that one yet. I'm gonna go to the back and I'll show you where this one ends. Right here. So you see this one goes up and there's another two-way splitter here, which is fed from this side. From the top, it goes above the diff and comes down. And this is where it connects to the flexible line. The other side of the three-way splitter, right here, goes directly to the flexible line. So here we don't have a hard line. This is the flexible line directly that goes to the trailing arm, and I'll show you what's there. Uh, so I'm going to undo this one now, and I'm going to try to take it out without bending it way too much. So it goes through the tunnel here to here. With this nut at the end, it's gonna be tricky, but it should come out from this hole here. I'm also gonna remove this plastic line here, which is for the emissions. We're not gonna use it, it's not needed. And this is our fuel line, which I think we're gonna keep. Maybe I'm gonna spray some brake cleaner through it, or should we take it out to clean it? We need to clean it inside, we need to make sure that we don't have any rust in it. Anyway, I'll think about it, but I'm gonna take the plastic line out 
to give us access for this nut to go through here. Of course, I'm gonna do that on my own. Can't keep you here, sorry. Okay, so this is the rear line. I was able to take it out without bending it. And you see all these little bends here and there, like it is so precise. I mean, that's, I'm pretty sure, the original line that came out of the factory. And it's not in a really bad shape, actually. All the lines that come out are not so bad, but I'm happy that we're changing them. Anyway, um, let me show you also here where I showed you. Uh, that's the three-way unit that I showed you from under the car. And this is, you see on this side, is where the flexible line connects. And then we have a hard line here, following the trailing arm and coming here to the cylinder. The one on top is the one that goes above the differential and goes to the other side and connects to the other flexible line on the other side. And then we have the same situation on the other trailing arm. But I want to take out everything so I can clean it. Okay, <laughs> I took out the whole system and I assembled it again so you can understand it better. Rusty, can you stay away please? So this is the new line that I already made that comes out of the PDWA here. It's not bent, it's gonna be bent to fit. This is where it connects to the rear one in the middle of the frame. Then this one follows the frame, goes up and connects to one side of the three-way splitter. Then for the right wheel, this one goes above the differential, comes down and there's a little bracket on the frame where the flexible line is bolted to and the hard line connects to it. And this side of the flexible line is on the trailing arm. There's a little like a fork there and then the hard line to the wheel cylinder. And this is the other side here. The flexible line connects directly to the three-way splitter. You see on this side, the flexible line connects to a hard line. Here, the flexible line connects to directly to the splitter. And then again, on this gets mounted on the trailing arm on the fork. And this is where the hard line goes. This is what I was talking about, that somewhere I had a mistake in the sheet and that's where it is. Here, you see normally everywhere where we have male fittings, we have a bubble flare. Here, that's the only place on the rear wheel cylinders where we have a male fitting with a double flare instead of bubble flare. And that's because the wheel cylinder, I guess, inside has a bubble and it needs a double flare to, to match it. So I have to correct my sheet. Rear brake cylinder to flexible holes, 17 inches, two brake, two lines, but here we have a male with a double flare. So I'm gonna have to change this to this. That's the only place. Okay, so yes, my sheet was wrong. Okay, everything is remade now in copper nickel lines and now I'm just gonna disassemble it and assemble it on the car. Okay, so it is all assembled now. Here, it's where it starts from the PDWA, the rear side. It goes down, so it comes down, makes a turn here around the frame and goes through the hole and connects to this union here. Then the next line continues through these holes and through the tree. I don't know why they call it a tree or t-shirt or whatever that makes all these curves here I have no idea why that's how it goes and goes into the three-way splitter from here it splits to the left and the right let's see the right side first this is where it goes up above the diff there's a little clamp there that clamps it and holds it above the drive shaft so it doesn't 
even though it's like three inches above but <laughs> it doesn't matter then it comes down on the other side and goes into the flexible line here and then the flexible line goes to the trailing arm from there another line continues and here i let it loose because we have to flush these uh, wheel cylinders so it's not connected there yet and the other side is the same here for the left wheel the flexible line is connected directly to the three-way splitter and then the same here the hard line comes this way and i let it hang here until we flush the cylinders so with that our brake system is almost complete what's left is just to flush the calipers and the wheel cylinders in the back and connect the brake lines and then we're gonna fill it up with dot 5 and we're gonna bleed the brakes and we should be good to go so that's gonna happen in the next video because this one becomes way too long that's when we're gonna deal with the calipers and the wheel cylinders and we're gonna hook them up and i know that i said that i was gonna look at the front wheel hubs in this video but it's, it becomes long now so we're gonna deal with that in the next one and uh, about the height and about the shocks i don't know we will see what we're gonna do there i want to take care of the fuel line too because we have to hook up the gas tank so so far we've been running the engine out of a jug but we want to connect the gas tank and i want to look at it and see if it is clean inside or it's gonna need de-rusting or whatever the fuel line looks like it's not too bad but i guess we're gonna take it out now it is not connected to anything it's just loose so probably we're gonna take it out and we're gonna try to flush it as well clean it inside because probably it's rusty uh, maybe i don't know we can fill it up with rust converter maybe <laughs> but like i said that's gonna be in the next video because i'm tired today i'm super dirty i went under the car thousand times under above under above it's like <laughs> it's not easy to replace brake lines when the body is on the frame already anyways uh that's gonna be everything for today guys thanks for watching commenting subscribing sharing and supporting the channel and i'll see you in the next one in which we're gonna do all the things that i just mentioned and maybe more so <laughs> thanks for watching guys bye